Sure, man. So, you know, my background is in the the kind of behind the scenes. I am internet marketing tech stuff. So that's where I, I started in web design, kind of migrated towards the, the internet marketing world. And, and now I work with uh, mainly big launches to, to manage just the day-to-day tech stuff and and put together the different campaigns that go out. Um, and I also, I, I build a lot of different tools that, well, hitting the mic too, uh, build a lot of different tools that marketers use, um, including the one we're going to talk about today. And that came with the membership. Um, so, you know, I, I kind of a guy of a lot of different hats, but right now my focus is mainly uh, how to get the most out of my investment in advertising for the different products that either I'm managing for a client or I, I manage for myself. So, Very cool. So do you have any sort of, you know, uh, special kind of like tricks or different things that you do with retargeting that you wouldn't say is kind of normal use of retargeting? Yeah, well, so, I mean, I I have this basic rule that if you're advertising anything, it, it, you need to have retargeting because retargeting is kind of the, the newest version of follow-up marketing. So if you're uh, familiar with running um, email campaigns, so someone opts into your email list and you do like a seven email follow-up, um, it's, it's what works in marketing. So if you're doing advertising, you need the same type of technology in place to follow up and retargeting. What it does is as opposed to normal ads, which show the frequency, you know, the, the amount that the ad actually shows on average for a normal ad is about one to one between one and two on a retargeting ad, because you know, they had enough interest to click on the link the frequency is through the roof, which is a good thing actually with retargeting. So the higher the frequency, the better uh, generally is what I've found is, as far as conversions go. So the frequency may be as much as like 60. So it shows 60 times this ad and generally I have them in the sidebar. And it's all, to me, it comes down to a, a branding point. So, um, so I'm advertising an affiliate product. Like right now I'm advertising uh, a software piece as an affiliate And anybody who clicks on my link, I know they're generally going to be interested in that software. Um, It's not that they didn't buy because they're not interested. It's there's there's a lot that goes into the buying process. And that's where retargeting can come in to actually remind them. Maybe they just left the page because uh, they were too busy or they they didn't have time to see the whole message. So what I do is I'll retarget anything that I'm promoting because that's how you're going to boost conversions overall. Um, so I guess it's it's a basic principle. It's not so much a, a super ninja tip, but it's you should retarget everything that you're promoting, um, especially affiliate products, because you're not always going to get that sale on the first click. Uh, so the more you can put the message out in front of your targeted audience, the more likely you are to get a sale. Cool. So a minute ago, you mentioned too that you mostly run sidebar ads. Um, you know, most people you hear these days are talking about the, the you know, the in stream, the, the the ads that are just right news in the feed. Feed. news yeah. feed. That's what we're looking yeah. for. Yeah, the news feed ads. Uh, why why do you run the sidebar ads versus news feed ads? Well, so I do I do both, but I separate them. Okay. So I'll have two campaigns. I'll have my news feed campaign, and I'll have my sidebar campaign, mainly because I want a different graphic. And here's just a little, I guess, insight. Um, in the news feed, you know, images of people work really well. So like a face and eyes, like something people will relate with. It doesn't look so much like an ad, especially with retargeting. Um, it's okay. Yeah, it's okay to make it look like an ad. Obviously, if you have a you know a bit of text in there or the logo or whatever, like it it should not just look like a selfie. But at the same time, like um, I've found the most effective ads are the ones that like like get the attention so that they'll read the message um because if they're not if they're not interested in what they're seeing they're just going to glaze over because there's a million things in the newsfeed. uh and then in the sidebar what i do is i'll generally just have the logo so if i'm retargeting uh the software pack, for instance the webinar jam um in the sidebar i just have a logo of of the software uh, um so What's, what that is doing is it looks like an ad. They know it's an ad. The call to action in that is buy. So I don't waste um, impressions by or, or clicks by people who aren't interested in buying right now. I tell them like what the ad is about in the sidebar. I say, hey, you can buy it now and save. 
give them a benefit for buying today um, and because that's where people are know for sure in the sidebar that it's an ad so it's okay for it to look more like an ad um, so those are I mean it's not I don't have it down to like rocket science but that's the general principle I've found that works really well in the sidebar it's okay for it to look like an ad in the news feed get their attention before you telegraph that you're selling something um, and that that works really well. I mean, I've found, especially with the retargeting, you know, it works really well. So, with the do you um, do you do different kind of goals in the uh, in the news feed versus sidebar? Like, would, in the news feed, would you kind of do like an optimized CPM, kind of optimizing for conversions or opt-ins versus the sidebar, maybe optimized for clicks? Yeah, in the news feed, I mean, anytime you can optimize for conversions is best. And I mean, especially if you're doing a big affiliate promotion, what I generally recommend to people is reach out to the person you're promoting and say, hey, hey share that conversion pixel with me because I want to optimize for conversions. Because even if you're doing affiliate promotions, uh, you generally you can reach out and they'll say, yeah, I'll share a conversion pixel with you. They put it on their thank you page. You don't need to give them a pixel. They can actually go in and hit share pixel and then you apply that to your ad. And anytime you do that, your ads are going to perform way better than just a CPM or CPC. Uh, so optimizing conver for conversions is best because what Facebook does is every time you get a conversion, whether it's a lead or a sale, they look at that as, okay, they pull that person and say, here's the demographic of the person that converted. Let's focus our impressions on those kinds of people. Uh, so they're optimizing buyers for you. Um, so it's way more effective to do that. Generally, though, if I don't have access to a conversion pixel, I'll do CPM in the sidebar. So I just I want it in their face as much as possible, even if it's just like they don't even see it. Their their brain is still <laughs> pulling that data in, um, and over like sixty impressions, they they know. I have people come up to me like, "Oh, I know, I know you. You're from the. I see you on Facebook all the time." And like, they're not friends with me. It's just they see my ad all the time because they went to my page. Um, and that's cheap. So I can get a thousand impressions for 10 cents, you know, something like that, uh, you know, 50, whatever it is. But it's it's a great way in the sidebar. And then in the newsfeed, it's CPC generally. And it may be a little more expensive. But if I know that I can spend two dollars on a click, but my average earnings per click is four dollars, I'm doubling my money. Mm -hmm. You know, so I it's a numbers game at that point. And if you're if your promotion is effective, you're promoting a good product, and you know your earnings per click on cold traffic, uh, you're going to see a return. And even if you're breaking even at a certain point, it's not so bad because you're building a bigger retargeting list uh, that you can remarket, <laughs> remarketing, retargeting, remarket the offer to um, with different contexts. So having multiple retargeting ads isn't a terrible idea. Um, with different messages, especially if you're promoting a launch. So not to go on a tangent, but launches have specific messaging. Like the Webinar Jam launch, it's in a closing phase right now. So that promotion to me is, okay, save $100 right now by buying it. Uh, that's one retargeting ad. Oh, Included is Webinar Genesis 497. That's another ad. You know, so like it's going away soon, and that all those things that work in marketing, you can build ads around. Uh, so that works really well in launches. Um, and just one more quick thing, and a lot of people don't have this ad type yet, but it'll be coming on more and more. The uh, the multi uh, image ads. Have you seen those? Uh, so, yeah, I've, I've I've seen them in kind of in the back end of the ad manager. Haven't played with them yet. Yeah, so those work really well, actually. Um, so what I did recently was I created um, a retargeting ad for Retarget Engine, and I had four different options. So you could go check out the offer, you could go check out the training, you could get a free mind map, and or you know buy now the plugin. Mm -hmm. And when they got to the landing page, it was the same four options. So uh, with the one that they clicked highlighted on the page. Mm -hmm. So that you selected this, but you know, did you want to look at these different options? And then you know, I just created kind of this little crazy web of retargeting uh, based on what they did. So if they got the opt-in, I retargeted to the product. If they got the product, I retargeted to the upsell. Uh, so it was like a funnel within, its, within retargeting without any real, it had email follow-up too, but the retargeting is what um, I could track conversions on that. And I was seeing, 
for every five dollars I was spending, I was making like fifty dollars. You know, it, it wasn't terribly scalable because it was so niche, but it was super effective. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's just another little thing people can investigate is kind of that contextual advertising, you know, based on actions they actually take. So let's uh, let's stick with targeting for just a second. So mm-hmm. with um, you know, with retargeting, obviously you have to have kind of the initial traffic getting to the site before you can start to retarget them. Mm-hmm. Do you have any kind of tips or strategies on targeting to get that initial traffic? Because everyone sure. I've talked to you so far kind of seems to have a slightly different strategy on on their targeting methodology. So yeah, yeah. So you know, I'm not like. I wouldn't say I'm a super ninja ads guy. Like I don't spend all day researching the the crazy in depth ways to to get cheap clicks and all that. But what I do do huh, is um, I focus on optimization. So I'll start with as big an audience as I think my ad will be effective with. So I'll target like three hundred thousand people, men, women, all ages. I'll start at the top. So I'll start with an interest, and I'll I'll start with five or so images and and keep I, I generally keep one type of message and just change the imagery because I found that the imagery makes such a big difference for some reason um, more even as long as the copy is good the imagery is what's going to make people see the ad could be wrong but that's, <laughs> that's what's worked with me um, and then what I'll do is about every other day I'll go in and change the targeting and that's probably like not what most people do. They, you know, the, if an ad doesn't work, you start a new ad. But it, what I do is I'll go in and I'll do a report, right? So you can see who's clicking. So if I start with an ad, three hundred thousand people, and I see one of my ads is getting a one percent click through rate at three hundred thousand people, or or point five percent. With with that big an audience, you're going to see lower click through rates, obviously. Um, and maybe I'm spending a dollar, two dollars a click. So what I'll do next is I'll go in and change. I'll look at who's clicking. So maybe it's men 18 to 35 is actually a 10% click-through rate. Where women age 47 to 50 is a 0.001% and it's uh, $20 per thousand impressions. You know, So I'll cut out the, the people who aren't clicking. So I'll change my ad based on gender and age after that. And then I'll keep doing that until I'm down to an audience size that... I think I can run for a good month um, and still get clicks that are... So I, I usually end up, after about a week of testing, I'll spend about $100 in testing to get the right demographic for that ad specifically, and then I'll scale it up to $100 a day. Mm-hmm. So And that, I can get 20 cent clicks and dollar conversions on opt-ins because I've got the right perfect demographic for that ad, not necessarily for the product, um, even though that's kind of a given, but it's about the campaign at that point. So that's my, that's the only technique that I have that I use that's been super effective consistently. You know, you'll hear a lot of different strategies um, that work well, but they might not work consistently. Mm -hmm. Um, So this is the one thing I've found that I do every time and I always will get predictable results even though I you know I'll still spend a lot of money but I will make 20 30 40 sometimes 200% on that ad campaign with that method. I never lose money on that method where other methods where it's just kind of like throwing a bunch of things at the wall and see what sticks. Um I've been burned a lot. We all kind of have with yeah. with Facebook you'll spend 500 bucks and be like I got like 20 opt-ins. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's that's what works for me, and I I I'm open. I you know I'm always looking for new ideas, but it's you can't go wrong with optimizing an ad. That's for sure. So do you break? So when you said you you cast kind of the wide net and you go after like a target of three hundred thousand, is that all just in the single ad set, or is like do you break up a whole bunch of audiences into different ad sets? Um, I generally stay in one ad set, so I'll I'll start like I'll. I view it as kind of a campaign. So my, this campaign is to generate leads and then the thank you page sells the product. And then there's a follow-up campaign in the email and retargeting. So the campaign itself all has to be consistent. The messaging all needs to be consistent. So I try not to change the messaging too much because if the message isn't going to 
work, the ad isn't going to work at all anyways, and the conversions won't work. So you have to start with the right message. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that you can find through testing different ad copy and uh, things like that. But I, I generally focus on that more than um, anything else. Like, does the opt-in page message match the campaign message and match the email messaging? Is it all consistent? So if, if that isn't in place first, then everything else isn't going to help. You know, you could optimize, have all these ninja tricks, but you're not going to see a return on your investment. In the, and maybe you will for a time, but it's not going, it's a long-term strategy versus hit and miss. Mm -hmm. Just guess what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Because, uh, I mean, the, the tactics that I've, I've always used has been, you know, one ad set is one target. Mm -hmm. so, so let's say I'm doing an internet marketing kind of thing. Maybe I'll target Wine Dice. That's one ad set. Maybe I'll target mm -hmm. Frank Kern. That's one ad set. Maybe I'll target, you know, internet marketing, just the topic. That's yeah. another ad set. The problem with that is... Since Facebook moved the you know the the cost to per ad set instead of per campaign, every uh -huh. time you set up a new ad set, you're getting yeah. that individual ad set. So I, I like I like what you're talking about. The only um, the only kind of question, the only downfall of that is every time you go in to kind of optimize or tweak, mm -hmm. doesn't Facebook make you go through the whole um, process of getting it reapproved every time you remove a target off of an ad set? Yeah. Well, so I don't change the interests. I never change the interest. I only change the age and demographic. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I might like one ad campaign I did. I typed in everything I could think of related to freelancers, like freelance web designers. Like that was my target audience. So I did magazines. I did. I ended up with like a million person audience, and the ad is still running. I found I did thirty different ads, imagery, text. I just I just threw everything I could at it because I knew I was going to get a lot of impressions and a lot of data. And with a million people. And now all I'm advertising to is men age 27 to 37 um, in that interest group. And it's about 30,000, maybe 40,000 people I've got it down to. And But that ad has like 60 shares, like 25, uh, what is it, 25 likes, like all the different you know social stats. But that helps boost that ad even more. So because of the social proof, um, so I don't remove the interest, but it does, when you change the demographic, you, it does need to get reapproved. but I haven't found that that affects, um, the, the main thing that affects wh whether ads are going to be effective in the long term, I found is the relevancy score. Mm -hmm. My relevancy score is 10 out of 10 mm -hmm. always. If it's under 10 out of 10, like I, I see it as my I'm not niche enough in the, the messaging or the audience. So um, so that's kind of the new metric for me is not so much, I mean, click-through rates, yeah, are gr it's good to know you have to have good click-through rates, but that'll change based on um, Facebook will present it to different groups of people, and it's that, that rate will go up and down. Mm -hmm. But the relevancy score, you need to keep the same. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like it's super fascinating because I know what Facebook is doing when they optimize. They they focus on what they know is going to work best first because they're optimizing for conversions, and then it's kind of like it, it melts down to the lesser you know people that log in like once a you know a week kind of thing. Um, but yeah, so just to answer your question, I don't change the interests. I have I'll have five interests in one ad set, which I you know, and people say don't have mobile and. And newsfeed and right bar all in the same one. Sometimes I, I'll do that anyways, just because I'm in a hurry. But you you do want to um, just another little tip. If you are keeping mobile in the same ad set, you want to make sure your page is mobile optimized. Like I will strip out. Like with OP2, you can do a mobile redirect, right? Mm -hmm. With Optimize Press 2. Um, so I'll detect if they're mobile and I'll make it super simple opt-in and I'll tell them on the opt-in, I'll say, Hey, I see you're on your cell phone. You want me to email this to you? And that, that for mobile, cause 50% of clicks, man, I'm telling you are mobile, like yeah. for sure. And they're great clicks as long as your page is optimized. I doubled conversions versus the control, uh, when I did a mobile page and I told them on the page, Hey, I see you're on your iPhone. You want me to... <laughs> You know, you want me to email this to you? And it, it was awesome. Like, I was so happy because it was, like, getting great amount of clicks, but I was only getting, 
was getting 20% less opt-ins because I wasn't optimizing the mobile. Yeah. That's yeah, that's a really good tip. I've never even tried that with the mobile. I always I uh, whenever I've run ads so far, I've always done I don't care. Just it goes to mobile, it goes to desktop and mm-hmm. um haven't really kind of looked at where the conversions come from mobile versus desktop. So that's- Yeah, so in reporting you can break it down by device and I found like one of my ads it was 70% click through on mobile um and but I was only getting like 20% opt-in rate which isn't terrible, but then I, I changed that page to just a headline and a button and that little, like, I see you're on your cell phone, let me email it to you, and it went up to, like, 55%. Wow. So I, like, cut my ad costs in half right there, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, because I, wonder, I was doubling conversions. I wonder if that's, you know, part of Facebook's optimization process, though, if they look at, okay, most of his sales are coming from desktop, let's just send most of the traffic to desktop. I wonder if that's part yeah. of their conversion I, optimization. I imagine, yeah, I would say so. It's hard to say, but at the same time, it just, it's going to depend on your, so this was a lot of freelancers. So they're, you know, they're like me. They're on their phone all the time and they they click through ads. Like I click on ads all the time on my phone. Oh, yeah. And if it's easy for me, like if I can do it in less than three seconds, like I'm in. Mm-hmm. But if it's like a big page or it's like something's out of proportion, it's not responsive, um, it's not, it doesn't have to be pretty. Like my pages are high contrast, red, black, you know, like I keep it easy to digest. I don't do fancy imagery all that much. Mm-hmm. You know, video backgrounds do work pretty well because they break kind of that, that, um, uh, what do you want to call it? The ad blindness, I guess, or banner blindness. Um, but with mobile, you don't want to. You want them. You want to get the email because they're not going to buy mo- most. I mean, point zero five percent of my sales come from mobile, and it, that's not from lack of optimization. It's people aren't into putting their credit card in on their phone unless they're like yeah. in a hurry to buy an airport ticket, you know, or something. Right. People um, aren't buying on their phone, but they might opt in on their phone and buy later when they get to their computer, kind of thing. Exactly, and that's where retargeting, dude. I I turn off mobile for retargeting unless it's the right, um, unless it's like a branding ad, you know, with just the logo because I want the impression. Um, but for optimizing for clicks, like turn off mobile for retargeting because they're not generally going to buy on mobile. You want them on the desktop. So now, do you do anything with lookalike audiences? You know, I. It's funny because I just started looking into turning a retarget. It, they just turn out so big. Like the like, I took a twenty thousand person retargeting list. I did a look like, and it was two point one million people. And I was like, "Well, that's smallest, yeah." Yeah, I'm like, "That's San Diego, you know? Like, that's the whole pop. It's hard, but at the same time, if you start with that and then niche it down, um, it could work really well. Mm-hmm. I I can't say that I've done that yet, but that's um, any way you can generate an audience that you are fairly certain is going to respond to your message Mm -hmm. and it's new, um, that's awesome. Like that's the hardest thing to do I found in advertising is finding new audiences. Right, right. Always end up defaulting to the same 200,000 people Mm -hmm. when there's, you know, 300 million English speakers on Facebook that I could possibly reach out to. It's 30,000, you know, (laughs) or 300,000. Yeah, Uh, I mean, going through this whole process of creating this course and you know I when I first started I was I I considered myself a you know pretty good at Facebook advertising I understood the concepts did you know had some really successful ads run but didn't completely understand you know what was making them successful what didn't and throughout the process of you know creating this course I feel like I've kind of become I I would consider myself like a Facebook ads expert now because Mm -hmm. I've interviewed so many people and had to learn through doing and creating this course and all that kind of stuff and right. one of the things that I've learned from everybody who's gone through the course, all the feedback we've gotten, everything, um, is that all people really want to know is how other people are targeting. That's <laughs> right. Like, that's it. Like, yeah. people don't really, people kind of understand the concepts of what kind of images are going to stand out, which is what's going to blend in. People understand, you know, what kind of copy grabs attention versus what just gets passed over. People, they kind of understand all that stuff. All anybody wants to know is, like, how do I just dial in my targeting? How do I get right. the targeting dialed in? That's like 90% of what yeah. comes up for people is I don't know how to do the targeting. So that's why I kind of stick to the targeting for the interviews, like the majority of the yeah. call. Yeah. But, um, 
Audience Insights is great for that, man. I'm sure everybody's been talking about that. Um, that's generally what I'll use because I'll I'll look at ads that have done well. I'll pull that audience in and I'll look at the demographics, what they like, who they are, and I'll just like try to get to know them. You know, like who are these people that are buying my right. stuff? Right. Um, and the more you can know about your customer, the better, you know, give the, the, the whole like avatar thing works pretty well, like define who they are. Um, but at the same time, like that's, that's where you can create a whole new campaign based on another avatar. Right. So like, this is something I've, I've been looking into doing with, you know, we were talking about some of the dynamic stuff on the page, um, on, on pages, like changing the messaging based on the people that are visiting. And I think the next step to all of this, like once you've exhausted the audience you know, mm-hmm. pick a new, completely different audience and make a new campaign. Mm-hmm. So you'll look, you look at what car dealerships do or, or like uh, car companies. Mm-hmm. And they advertise different commercials on different channels based on different demographics. So you'll, if you're watching the nightly news, Lincoln's going to show you an ad that's about comfort and safety and five star this and that. But if you're watching Spike TV, I don't even have cable anymore. I'm just throwing out random channels. I don't know. <laughs> but or I'm just yeah. taking your word for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But they'll, you know, Lincoln might show like a different angle of how cool it is. They'll have Matthew McConaughey doing a monologue or something. You know, so like like you can create new campaigns with a different message, but you have to change everything. You have to change the sales page, you have to change the opt-in page, you have to change the ad. You can't send the same audience through the same funnel. And the that's difficult because it creates a lot of work. But if you're using some dynamic stuff like tagging them based on, you know, the ad they click and change the message. And you can do this big picture. Like you can make a real estate funnel for a product. Mm-hmm. Any, you know, anytime you have a product, it can reach different audiences. You just have to change the message. Um, so I am all for finding new targeting. But at the same time, if you don't change your message... You can find a new audience, but they're not. The message isn't going to resonate. Like internet marketing audiences eat up anything that has to do with um, generating revenue. Mm-hmm. We know that, so it's easy to talk like that. But what do personal trainers care about? They care about empowering their customers and empowering themselves to have the freedom to focus on what they love to do with their customer. You know, like like that kind of understanding of what drives people. That's why internet marketing is so easy. <laughs> and advertising internet marketing people is so easy. And it's why it's, in, it's only about a 300,000 person niche is because it's easy to talk about money. Mm-hmm. Everybody likes money and income in that audience. And it's a pretty, it's not so much an age and gender thing, even though it, airs towards men 18 to 40, um, you know, like anything else income related. But, you know, and I have a hard time advertising to women. I don't know if anybody else, I, it's, I, I thought I knew women, but I don't. Um. <laughs> That's actually very interesting because learn to blog our demographic, our targeting, right? 90% women. Yeah. Isn't that funny though? Like, but it, it's hilarious. Like I was like, I wrote a whole campaign just for women that I thought would work with women. And it sucked. I was like, come on, like this is like Marie Forleo everything. I just like emulated. Um so I just I just realized I'm not good with women. That's just you know, that's 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 not a targeting issue. That's a Sean doesn't know how to talk to women issue. Um so anyways, yeah, but it, like to touch on the like I would like to switch that conversation in people's heads a little bit. Like targeting is super important, but focus on your like like pick a targeting audience, yeah, and and get to know it. But like change. Here's a funny thing to do: pick up a um, a popular science magazine or a men's health any magazine out there on the shelves, and go back to the advertising section, and they'll try to sell you on why you should advertise in their magazine. And they'll say we reach this demographic; they buy this kind of stuff. Like they know their demographic. You could call them and get on the phone, and they'll pitch you on who their audience is. Do you know your audience that well? You know, most people don't. I, I know my audience pretty well. 
and I, it's funny, the ad that's working so well is basically you. It's a bearded guy. You've probably seen the ad. Um, he's like <laughs> going, like, yeah. yeah. And that ad is going off the hook. But I've at, I tried 50 different ads. I think it's, it's hipsters. They like the beards. And that's the one where you land on it and the, the thing's like slowly moving across the screen and you're like, stop. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. like, dude, that's such an urgency thing. Like it's so, it gives you anxiety. You like almost have to opt in. Um, I don't recommend it. I I recommend it. It's great. Um, I changed. I tested it left versus right, and moving to the left for some reason was more uneasy than you know. I don't know. People like left to right. They don't like right to left. Anyways, um, that's a whole other. Uh, but essentially, what you're trying to say is targeting is important. You know, yeah. most people feel like there's some sort of secret sauce in like finding that right target. But what's more important is the correct message to market match. You know, finding yeah. that exact message for the target that you're putting things in front of. Yeah, so many people try to get so specific with the targeting, which is great. Like the more specific the better. However, like if you're in the business to make money, which everyone kind of is if you run a business, like you should ov- obviously have bigger goals than and aspirations than just money, but if you can't make money, you don't have a business. Um the broader you can advertise to and be effective, the higher scalability your business has. If you can only advertise to 10 people, your product better be 100 grand. If you're selling a $37 product and you can only advertise to 100 people, you're going to have a really hard time scaling your business. Mm -hmm. So what I err towards is larger target groups and then whittling down the audience. Um, and, and getting the message right. You know, that's a copywriting is a $20,000 per hour skill. Like if you can do it right or not, maybe not 20,000 per hour, but uh, yeah, give me a copywriter who knows my audience and I'll pay him five grand for an hour of his time to write up an email or a landing page, maybe three hours, whatever. Um, because that's what gets the conversion. It's not so much the ad, it's the campaign. Mm-hmm. Uh, overall um, and people will argue against that you know you look at the t-shirt niche and stuff um, they got some serious ninja stuff but you know put them put them trying to sell a car um, and they're gonna want to you know put I'm an engineer decal on it and target that car to engineers you know like like you can't get if if you want a scalable business you can't get so niche that you cancel out you know, potential customers because of your message is what I'm, I guess I'm getting at. <laughs> so as far as the actual ads, there's only one thing that, it, one real quick kind of thing I want to ask real quick, and that's with the images. You mentioned that you found that the images are real important for the success of the ads. Um, <laughs> what what kind of images do you tend to use and where do you tend to get the images? Like, sure. Like, and do you I, tend to use stock photos or do you make them yourself or do you take screenshots? You know, what, what kind of scenes to work? It's funny because I, I, um, and I hesitate to share this because it works so well for me. Uh, but I, I have a sh- I have a Shutterstock um, account, right? And I'm a big fan. Like I don't like to grab Google Images and stuff. I've tried a bunch of random stuff, but what I've found works for my audience is um, Instagram esque filtered images. What I, like hipsterized imagery um, because my audience looks at a lot of that kind of imagery. They're on Instagram. They're 18 to 37 men. Um, and the imagery resonates with them. And they're web designers, so it's like they have an eye for design. Um, so I do use stock imagery. I I don't go heavy into calls to action. On A lot of my ads, they're just an image. And the call to action is in the description. Um, because I have found that you, the more you telegraph that it's an ad, the more likely they're to glaze over it. And that, you know, that has give and take on it because um, if you put an effective call to action or, or, you know, headline in the image itself, it can work well. But I've, I've personally found that base, like, imagery that they can associate with is what's getting uh, my audience to click and take action. Um, and I'll just give you an easy example of that. Like... The Dos Equis guy, the, the most interesting man in the world, those ads are so effective, not because older men um, who are in their late 70s resonate with the character. That's not their audience. Their audience is resonating with that character 
because they they aspire to be like that. Mm -hmm. It's not they don't see themselves in that person. Uh, they don't want to be a seventy five year old guy, but they want to have that level of awesomeness. Mm -hmm. So when you're creating imagery, don't don't use imagery that um, reflects your audience. Use imagery that they aspire to be. Mm -hmm. Um, and I found you know, it's hard to test that obviously because it's like, like how you'd have to, you know, you really have to look at like thousands and thousands and thousands of clicks to know that for sure. But it's, it's simple, uh, you know, advertising psychology yeah. that people resonate with people that they want to be not necessarily who they are. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And that, that actually has been a common theme among a lot of the interviews I've done too, is that people like to use the imagery that kind of will show the people, you know, it, a lot of people do use faces and that kind of stuff, and they'll show something that's kind of the end result, the benefit of going yeah. through whatever you're doing. So yeah, like you got to, here's a, I'm not to interrupt, I'm sorry. I, I do want to touch on that because this is something, you know, Ezra Firestone, he's a big Facebook ads guy, and something he brought out to me that was, I thought, very, very interesting um, in that aspect you got to be careful with what you promise in the ad on Facebook. If you promise too much and it's very emotional and it's very um, hyped, like it's almost too, like you can't say you're going to make a bunch of money, blah, blah, blah. but they even look at imagery too now, especially if you're doing a lot of ads. If you are doing like a fear campaign and you're showing someone like feeling pain and you're advertising the cure for that pain, like they will remove your ad or end your account if it's manipulative in their eyes. Like if, if, if you're advertising to grannies and they, you know, you show a grandma that's fallen on the ground and hurt herself life alert style, they see that as manipulative advertising. Right. So you have to, there's a fine line there. Like you definitely should show the benefit, but if your benefit is somebody driving away in a Ferrari, your ad may get approved, but in the long run, you are risking your account. They will shut down accounts based on over manipulative advertising. It's right. very peculiar, but I've seen it happen a lot to a lot of people. They're like, "Why did my ads? My ads are all compliant. They're all compliant." And then they'll hear they'll hear back from Facebook eventually saying, "Well, your images were manipulative," mm. and that's not to fear, that's not to scare people. Um, that's just like a PSA. Like like be careful with your imagery because they look at that too, especially if you're doing a lot of volume mm -hmm. yeah. and they'll, they'll look back at ads you did three years ago. You know, it's crazy. Yeah. Uh, so anyways, that, that's just two cents on that. Just, to, um, yeah. just something recently I've come across that people are talking about because Facebook is trying to appeal more to the Walmarts of the world to advertise than small businesses right. um, or entrepreneurs. So you just have to kind of, walk that line a little closer towards conservative um, and, you know, just test a lot of stuff. But air, I air pretty conservative on my imagery. I used to have a bunch of random red borders, you know, all this stuff that does do generate clicks, but it doesn't necessarily generate sales, you know. Um, there's... You know, all of all of that you can discuss for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the example that I was I was going to use was I was talking to one guy. I don't know if you know him, John Hutchinson. Uh, okay. I was I was talking to him uh, in an interview, and he was saying when you when you run the ads, let's say you sell like baby teething rings, right? You don't want to show just like a picture of the teething ring or the baby even using the teething ring. You want to show a picture of like a happy mom because the happy mom is the result of the baby using the teething ring, kind of thing. So that, right. was, that was kind of the route that I was going to go down with that. But, um, yeah, I mean, what you're saying makes a lot of sense. Kurt talked a lot about that, um, mm. was, was the whole kind of, uh, Facebook does not want to see negative stuff. Like yeah. even, <laughs> even in organic, which we're about to talk about organic in just a second, even in organic newsfeed, if you're tending to post stuff that leans more negative, mm -hmm. it's not going to get the reach of the stuff that's positive and happy. No, no. And, and, and just one more thing I'll, I'll touch on from the um, just emotional side of things. Um, this is, I, I have a book, it's called uh, Brain Cells, but it's S-E-L-L-S. It's a great, great book, by the way, if you ever just want to kind of read about psychology and sales. Um, a lot of this is pretty straightforward, common sense stuff, but if you don't apply it, you just don't know it. Um, but I've found kind of these primal instinct type of imagery 
to work pretty well. Like uh, the one ad that is actually working really well, I, it's the only ad I've ever gotten to be effective with women <laughs> uh, because I just can't. But it the the it was for a landing page, like the you know an opt-in page. But it said uh, more leads equals more time, and it was a picture of a guy holding a baby. Mm-hmm. It was such a stereotypical ad. I felt kind of bad. I was like, like it's so stereotypical. Like women like babies. Like they should like this. Um, but it wasn't a it wasn't a woman with a baby. It was a guy with a baby. It worked better. I had both, and the guy with the baby worked better because she was seeing her family mm-hmm. and seeing kind of that message. And that may sound sexist, but it, the ad worked. Whatever. <laughs> um, but it was like an emotional. Uh, but not over the line kind of ad, I think. Um, but it 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 did work very well. Um, so, you know, looking at what people desire in their demographic, um, and thinking a little bit outside of the money uh, desire in the IM space works as well. So, you know, time. T- people want time. They want freedom. They want money, which. It's harder and harder to advertise about revenue mm-hmm. unless it's a B2B kind of product. Um, so, I mean, those are kind of things to keep in mind, too. Those primal desires um, work well in ads, even if it's something as simple as a landing page, you know, builder kind of deal. Cool. So let's um, let's move on to the organic stuff and just talk about it real briefly. Um, you know, you're somebody that obviously when – you post stuff, it gets a lot of clicks and a lot of likes, and you seem to have a lot of organic engagement. So what kind of advice, and obviously the course isn't really about creating Personal organic problem. engagement, but I do want to add a little bit of that into there so people can uh, you know, have a little bit of insights on, on what sure. works well. So what kind of you know, tips and... Yeah, dude, well, so it's funny. I've considered like making whole courses on this subject because it is interesting. Um, and a lot of people are in my shoes, and most business especially when they're getting started, are a hybrid of selling products and services. So when you're selling a product, you're using a lot of Facebook ads. And you can do that with services as well. But if they're higher end services, like 20 grand plus services, a lot of times um, the ad cost to generate a sale from that is outrageous. So you're going to spend you're going to have to bring in 5,000 leads and narrow that down to one sale to get with, with general advertising. But if you can connect on a personal level and personal Facebook profile works very well with this, with your target audience, like you're going to generate the high end service sales. So this is where my service business separates from my product business. My service of doing launch management Only about 50 people qualify for this service in my industry, you know, and I'm going to charge a lot for it. But those 50 people I'm all friends with on Facebook and they see when I post results from my business. Mm -hmm. And so anybody, you know, who's listening to this, if they have a service business and let's say their their target um, service product is is 20 grand plus find the business owners um who qualify and friend them like there's nothing weird anymore about friending people in your industry it's almost like a linkedin connection but it's more personal Mm -hmm. and i found um i'll just give you like it's not so much a campaign but it's what i do to connect with people who i think could use my service and i could make them a lot of money I'll friend them. I'll set them as a close friend because a lot of times I'll forget and I'll make a little note somewhere who they are. And I'll say, well, they could benefit from my service and I know what they do, but I'm not going to solicit them. I'm going to build a relationship first. So I'll set them as a close friend. When they make an update, you know, maybe they post a picture of, of their dog. And I'll go in without being creepy because that's one there's a fine line between randomly friending somebody um you know it's generally a good idea to have mutual friends with them um and going in and being overtly communicative with their posts but if you go in and be and like it and say that is awesome like keep it simple but literally they seeing your name is enough over six months if you do that 
selectively, um, you're going to build a rapport with that person. That's in, me and you. Uh, it's funny. I'm, we met on Facebook first before anything else. And that was kind of our connection. Like it was just we'd randomly comment on each other's stuff. And another little like ninja thing that sounds terrible, but it works really well is random. You know, the people you want to see your news feed posts, mm -hmm. you need to message them on a decently regular basis. Not anything weird. Maybe they post a blog post of their from their site and you message them and say, hey, I read your article, man. Like, here's what I really liked about it. Give them a compliment. You know, don't be weird. Don't solicit. Don't sell anything um, because they will eventually come to you. Uh, it's kind of like dating, you know. It's like don't don't be the guy at the bar that's the douchebag that's that's soliciting everything. Be the cool guy who brings everyone together, um, makes everybody become friends. Be the leader in the group, not the creepster, <laughs> you know. And and if you do that on Facebook and you do it well, and you know you know the people that do it well, the, and there's people who do it overboard. There's there's certain people who go over the top too. So you got to be careful with that. Um, but that's what I, you know, that's my service business. A hundred percent of my leads come, uh, or a hundred percent of my sales come through my personal Facebook because it's built in social. It's, you know, they, they, uh, the last five clients that I've done big launches for every single one has been through personal Facebook. Um, and I would say the personal Facebook side is done you know, half a million in sales through my career just through those service techniques. And I've never had to solicit my services because I just post results. Mm -hmm. So anybody who's listening who has a service business and is maybe they're heavy on LinkedIn, don't be afraid to do that on Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, that's it. That's all you've got to do. I mean, don't ever... I, I mean, if you... I don't want to say never solicit them. Like you may reach out and say, "Hey, let's have a conversation. I see what you're doing. I've worked with businesses like yours. Like I'd love to share some ideas." Like I've done that before and, and gotten sales. Because mm -hmm. um, if they don't know what you do, then they're never probably going to reach out. Uh, so yeah, and then things to post. Like it's funny. I I think you're right when you say negativity just doesn't do credence to what Facebook and marketing is about. Mm -hmm. You know, it's social media. I I don't hesitate to post if I'm having a bad day and say, oh, this sucks, because that's you're being a real person. But if you're constantly bashing people or if you're I mean, I think we all see the political messages and it's like, all right, I get it. That's fine that you feel that way, but like, are you wanting that message to be what people see because it's what people interact with the most is these negative messages and that's what you end up being attached to. Mm -hmm. I, I mean one person in particular comes to mind who I s talk to many different people and they're like oh I had to hide that person because of all this stuff they post. Don't be that guy you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, if your mission like I love Facebook for my connections with friends and family but Facebook is my income generator too. Um, so I view it as if I want to put it on my website, I'm not going to put it on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Um, and a lot of people don't view it that way and that's fine. But if you want to generate a lot of income, uh, with Facebook, your personal fro profile, that's how you would do it. It's not so much, um, soliciting, it's creating a, a good connection with influencers and people who can write you a $20,000 check without thinking about it. Um, and it's not that hard. It's really not. If I, I'm not super special when it comes to that. I just, I just really like connecting with people, uh, and it just adds up. There's this social like, just cloud that builds over time, you know. And the, and the more interactive you are, the better. And here's just a couple technical things. Um, the shorter the post, the more likely you are to, if it's text, keep it concise. I mean, I found like under 100, keep it Twitter style, like under 140 um, and like engaging questions, you know, have the, be the my number one thing, go out and post this today, guys, go post what was your first job, you'll get 100 comments if you have at least 1000 friends, that's a 10% engagement rate for a list of 1000 people interacting with you, which is a lot, that's like a 10% click through rate 
of a whole list. It's not 10% of people who clicked on an e, you know, um, that'd be a hundred percent click through rate on a hundred people. Anyways, um, <laughs> I'm not good at math evidently. Uh, so yeah, just keep it simple, concise, build that engagement. Um, and Facebook doesn't like links to outside stuff. Uh, so what I'll generally do is if I want to advertise something in my personal Facebook, I will post a question or something related to the topic and say, hey, and in the comments, I'll post a link to what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Very, I mean, sometimes I get lazy and I'll just post the link and it does okay. But a thousand times better is a text post with a link in the comments than it'll get way more edge rank than posting a link because Facebook doesn't want people off Facebook. They just don't. So they don't prioritize those posts. Well, not without paying at least. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Unless you want to. Yeah. And that's where advertising comes in. Yeah. Um, and even then, if you advertise into a Facebook post, generally I've, I've had a, I, I don't know if you talk to people, but I have not been successful with putting opt-ins in a Facebook iframe and sending traffic there. I don't know why. I still have, haven't, I haven't I, found I've it. had more success sending um, Facebook ad traffic off of Facebook than yeah. I have leaving it on. And I actually talked to Kurt about that. And it's actually been a change in Facebook's algorithm. Mm -hmm. They actually prefer that you send people off of their site now. Yeah. Here's why. Because websites now have Facebook pixels on them. Every mm -hmm. website outside of Facebook seems to have Facebook pixels on them. So by sending people away from Facebook, Facebook's collecting data yeah. that people are doing outside of Facebook <laughs> as well. Yeah, right? Dude, that's insane. So, I mean, it makes sense because I, I was like, I've got an SSL. I like, I framed it in and I like ran all this traffic and like they didn't optimize the ad. I was like, all right, fine. Like, not going to do that anymore. Yeah. Um, yeah, Facebook actually these days likes it when people are sent off the site because what they're actually looking at is they're looking at user activity when people are clicking away from Facebook so they could gather more data about the people so they can right. more effectively advertise. And they're also looking at um, bounce rates. They're starting yep. to track bounce rates. So if you send somebody over to a site and they're on the site for four seconds and they click away, they're going to give that a crap relevance score. If they click over to your site and they're on this site for 10 minutes, they're going to give it a much higher relevance score. So they're actually using that data to calculate re relevance scores as well. So I'll tell you what I'll do because that's very important. That relevancy score is a bounce rate dependent a lot of times. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll give you an ad template that, or not an ad template, but an opt-in page mm -hmm. that, I mean, with retargeting, I'm getting 85% of people to opt-in. So the initial opt-in is about 60%. And people who don't opt-in, I'll retarget back and I'll capture another 20%. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, but it's really simple 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 landing page uh but it does micro commitments it gets it gets people to commit um so i'll give you that for for the interview like you can show people that uh but the the print the principle of the ad is pretty simple principle of the landing page it's um you tell them what they're going to get you don't you don't make them guess what they're going to get don't make it a mystery you're going to get a pdf or a mind map then the headline is pure benefit, benefit of the benefit, like get this mind map because it's going to show you how to do this and the result is going to be this, mm -hmm. you know, and that, that can be a pretty concise headline, but like the one that's, you know, I, I have it like download this retargeting mind map so that you can save money on your ads, have higher conversions and generate more sales you know it's a pretty simple straightforward benefit and then the actual button is uh it's not it's a two-step so it's a button and then it shows an opt-in as opposed to just an opt-in um which you know everyone's seen that but I, I do it a little different it's like instead of doing a light box it just transforms uh, it's cool um anytime you can do something a little different it's going to break it's going to break the mind the the uh banner blindness um so I'll, I'll share that with you, so they can they can use that. It'll be it's an OP two template, so anybody who has Optimized Press can just install it. It'll be great. Um, but yeah, man, that's I mean, all of this kind of together. I guess if I'm going to share like the bottom line, what I want people to take away from this, um, don't chase the the latest magical thing that works with Facebook ads because Facebook changes all the time, just like Google, YouTube. Any ad platform, there's going to be an ad platform in 10 years that's going to overshadow 
all these other ad platforms probably. Maybe Facebook and Google merge and it's <laughs> whatever. Um, a- Apple's going to do something. We know it. <laughs> but the principle of the campaign has been relevant since the 1930s. You know, you watch Mad Men, it's a campaign. Mm-hmm. If you think in campaign terms, your ads are never going to fail. Yeah, the, a lot of them will, but you're going to always have a winner eventually. Um, you know, whether it's YouTube, whatever it is, if you look at the audience first, create a message for them, and then target them, like, that's the basics of it. You don't have to do all the ninja stuff, mm-hmm. you know. You, you can run any kind of advertising anywhere, and it will work yeah. uh, if you know what you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think, I, I think really the key, the key points, and this has definitely been the common theme across, like, all of the, the course is is really 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 understand your audience when you understand your audience you understand targeting you understand the wording that's going to work you understand the images if you understand your audience you're going to know what's going to work to get them to click that's yeah. point a point b b can crew and across everything your ad copy your ad image the opt-in that they hit after it the sales page after they hit the opt-in all of it should be a congruent you know the, the messaging across all of those things should be the same what yeah. they click on the ad, when they get to the opt-in page, they should see what they should have, what they expected to see when they clicked on the ad. After yeah. they opt in, they should see what they expected to see after they opted in. Just have that congruency. So, like, those are kind of the two huge kind of overlying points that almost everybody I've talked to has made. That's like that's what makes effective advertising. Right. Ab- yeah. Absolutely. And it, I mean it, it, it. It's in the early early days of internet marketing and the early days of even Facebook ads. There was just this like um, little area where you could just fudge things and you could just get massive results from one cent clicks. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Like, I have some campaigns that are 10 cent clicks, Mm -hmm. but it's because I've gotten so focused, they're going to click and it's optimized for impressions. So, those are still possible, but it's the advertising principles that got there. It wasn't some simple, cool trick. It was the basic principle that if you get the right demographic to look at the right messaging, they're going to be interested to click. I don't click on ads for minivans. I don't want a minivan. They don't advertise to me, though. <laughs> I don't see Hulu ads for, uh, you know, or Facebook ads for minivans. I see marketing tools. I see, you know, I see stuff that's relevant to me. Um, and that's why I generally advertise products that I would like because it's easy. Uh, but that's not a that's not a big picture solution. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, it it does make sense that you know if you know what you like and mm-hmm. you create yourself as that avatar, you could kind of target people off of what you know you'd be interested in. If the product is something that you would personally be interested in, it kind of makes sense. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And and it it does that does pose a problem to. I think well, as, you know, in the four hour work week, he brought out a great point. He's like, you know, don't go too far out of your comfort zone with products you want to sell, mm-hmm. because if it's like four steps away from something that you would use, you need to hire somebody who knows about that to do the advertising, and that's not a bad thing to do. You know, if you're wanting to sell something that makes a lot of money, but you don't know the demographic, get somebody who does. You know, and and and. Either, you know, have them help you or just talk to them and get to know it. You know, you can learn. Um, But yeah, at the end of the day, like, uh, I'm sure this is a common theme too. Just from the business side of things, there is a a threshold. And everybody that I know that does well in Facebook ads breaks this threshold eventually. and, And it's amount of spend per day to generate enough income to run their business. Mm-hmm. And it's it's that's how advertising has always worked with most businesses, but it seems kind of a new revelation for people in the internet marketing space. Um, you know, I I personally I spend anywhere from fifty to a hundred a day, and it's enough to run my business. But if I was spending five thousand a day, like Frank Kern, um, you know, my business would go up that level. I just haven't built out the infrastructure yet. Right, right. So so that's you know that's kind of a, a an interesting facet too. I think people can look at the bigger picture of what they're spending in relation to what they're making. Um, Because if you spend a million dollars a year and you only make a 20% return, that's okay. 
because you're still making 200 grand yeah. uh, profit. Um, so, anyways, that's a little tangent, but the, just from the business perspective, like this is a big business opportunity to build a real business with advertising as opposed to all the other things that seem to people send go to gravitate towards in the internet marketing field. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Cool. Well, I think I've taken up enough of your time. Let's <laughs> let's go ahead and uh, um, let's end it with this last question. Um, sure. Where can where can people go find out more about you and learn more from you? Sure. No. I well, I tell you guys, like it's been great talking about this. Obviously, like I I really enjoy. You can tell I just like get excited about it. Uh, it's because it's the business building side. I really like that. Um, so if if folks are looking to reach out, you know, the, the plugin, obviously go have an awesome time with it. Like it, it'll work great for what you're looking to do. Uh, my site is increase.academy, um, not increaseacademy.com, but increase.academy. It's those cool new domain names. Um, so, so go catch me over there or Sean.co. I like all these crazy <laughs> extensions. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, this is, this is kind of my, my wheelhouse in the sense that, my goal in business is to grow a great business and whatever is working for that principally is what you should focus on. So, um, so yeah, I really appreciate you guys having me on and, uh, yeah, folks feel free to reach out, find me on Facebook, friend me, and, uh, we'll definitely connect more. Awesome. Cool. I appreciate that. I'm going to go ahead and hit stop here on the recorder.